I think a lot of a lot of this whole nine to five thing is really broken. To to really care about when someone shows up and when they leave, we're measuring the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. What I want to measure is their output. Right. Are they getting the results on the stuff they're supposed to be doing for the amount that I'm paying them? Mm -hmm. I don't care if they work from three in the morning until six in the morning. As long as they're doing what I need gets done and they're getting the results for the money I'm paying, who cares? You've written some incredible books like Meetings Suck, and Double Double, uh, Free PR is one that now our company's starting to take a a really serious uh, commitment to, and then Vivid Vision, which you and I have been working on together as I've, I've hired you as my coach to help me. And it's been a great experience so far. And the Vivid Vision was just so great for me and Rob. What a great exercise. Thank you. For us to really understand, like, what are we supposed to do here? What's it supposed to look like? And now how do I fill in the gaps? Yeah. And I, it's great. I, one of your employees just grabbed me on the way in. He said he read another one of my books called The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs and said it made a massive impact. He and his wife were both. Who was that? I don't remember. He was Paul up. guy? Yeah. Reed. Reed. Yeah. I could see him saying that. Yeah, he was super excited about it. He was telling me all about how it's really made an impact. He's now getting up at five o'clock every morning. So that was kind of cool that one of the employees just read one at random. Yeah. Yeah. Well, your your book's been read by quite a few of our team. So that's why they when you walk in, they know you. They know who you are. It's it's kind of, uh, you're like a celebrity here. Just cool. So you take guys like you, you know, Marcus Limonis, any of those Shark Tank guys, they jump into business that they have no experience in, sure. but they can make a major impact in because they know that 90% of business is the same. Totally. And that 10% you should have as the guy that I'm partnering with. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, it's funny. All of, all of the CEOs that I coach around the world, I've worked with clients now in 28 countries. I don't know anything about their physical business. I don't know their product or service, but I'm really good at the business of business, right? Mm -hmm. Everything from vision, operations, execution, people, culture, how to scale a company, but I don't work with companies trying to figure out what they do. That's their job. Right. Right. So yeah, you're right. That, that a lot of the stuff around business is the same. Well, we've gotten to work with over 1400 studios now throughout the world. And as exciting as it is, you, you start to notice patterns when you meet with that many studio owners sure. and you travel as much as we did to, to really like get a, get a good understanding as to what people are doing right, great and not so great. I think everyone's really passionate about sales and marketing. It's like the sexiest part of business, I yeah. think, right? There's so many marketing conferences, but there's not really a ton of operation conferences or sure. customer service conferences. And that's usually where I see that they fall short. They're not growing because they're constantly recycling business and they're not keeping and compounding on top. It's funny. If I think back now in, in all my years of 12 years of, of coaching CEOs and even, oh, I'll just focus on that, the 12 years of coaching CEOs, I don't spend much time on the sales side or the marketing side. I noticed that. Because what's interesting, yeah, I actually hadn't even thought about it until you're just mentioning it, but that really is what comes later. Yeah. Like if you don't, it's almost like building a house. If you don't have the foundation really strong and the electrical and the plumbing in and then the walls being built, it's like, don't worry about getting the wolf stove and the fancy cabinets. That'll come, but the foundation has to be strong. And without the foundation, what's the point of bringing in more clients? In fact, I was coaching someone the other day and we were talking about, let's not focus on sales and marketing on purpose because we're not ready for the influx that it's going to bring in. We actually have to get the foundation right before we actually bring in more clients. When you say foundation, for everyone listening that's going, okay, got What's foundation. Yeah. yeah, so define that. So I look at every business like a jigsaw puzzle. So remember when we were a kid and we got a jigsaw puzzle and it came in the box? What's the most important part of the jigsaw puzzle is the picture on the front of the box, right? Right. I call that the vivid vision, okay. right? So if we don't know what the company looks like in three years, if we can't describe what it looks like to our customers, our suppliers, our employees, they have no idea what we're building. It's almost like building a jigsaw puzzle with all the pieces upside down. Right. You need to see the, the picture first. And then I look at the four corners of the jigsaw puzzle. The corners for me are the core values, your core purpose, your BHAG, which is a big, hairy, audacious goal, and the plan to make the vivid vision come true. Now, those are the four corners. Like when you open a jigsaw puzzle, you look for the four corners and then you do the sides of the puzzle. And for me, the, the size of the puzzle are the people systems, which are the recruiting, interviewing, selection, onboarding, and training. And then the strategic thinking, so the planning, the goal setting, and then the meeting rhythms is the third side, is all the meetings that you need to actually scale up and support the people. And then the fourth side is the financial systems. The middle, all the big shiny object stuff is sales and marketing and culture. But if you don't have all those kind of the picture of what you're building, the corners and the sides, the rest of it doesn't even really matter yet. So when we talk about core values, core purpose, a lot of people are hearing Okay, we got purpose, we got mission statement, we got vivid sta sure, vi whatever. vision statement, we've got core, yeah, we've got all these different things that kind of seem the same and repetitive. Yeah. If you can help me understand the difference between number one, core values and core purpose, let's start there. And then I want to dive into vision statement and vivid vision because I know you see those two things differently. Sure. So the core values, or the core purpose is kind of the one core underlying reason that we exist as a company, right? Or as Simon Sinek and start with why, I would say it's your why. Now, when you're building a company, the why can't just be the CEO's why. It has to be the why of the company. Why do we exist? So Apple's why 
is creating insanely great products that challenge the status quo and change the human race. That's why they exist. My why is to help entrepreneurs make their dreams happen, right? That's why I do what I do. That's your core purpose. Your core values are the four or five core underlying principles that you operate day to day as a person and as a company. So mine are deliver what you promise, respect the individual, have some effing fun. Those have to be, and it's interesting, I was coaching a, a company called Hootsuite years ago. I was coaching, we know EO. And, yeah. yeah, so I, I coached Ryan Holmes, the CEO, and then their leadership team led their strategic planning for a year. When we were doing one of our offsites, we realized that they, what they thought were core values were actually behavioral traits. So the test of a core value is, are you willing to fire someone who breaks it? That's whether it's a core value or not, right? Talk to me about but that. Delivering really what you promise. Because right. here's something that I think a lot of people, they say this, we hire and fire by our core values. Most don't. So t give me an example of a core value that might be, bro or has been broken in a business like yours or one that you've coached. Yeah, respect and that the individual. So I'll give you an example of respect the individual. This is 30 years ago. I was sitting in an office and, and my VP was really being disrespectful to one of the women in the office. Something that under today's Me Too era, he'd be fired for. Okay. Like that, right? Just disrespectful in his tone and the words he was using and to a human being. And I called him out and I said, Kevin, respect the individual. And he turned to me and he was pissed off and said, don't ever call me on the core values. And he walked out of the office and slammed the door. And I'm like, oh shit, I'm getting fired. And about five minutes later, he called me into his office. I'm like, yep, I'm getting fired. And I walked into his office. He's like, don't ever call me out on the core values in front of the team. And I said, then don't break them. And I don't know where that response came from, but it was so visceral that to me, the core values meant don't break them. Right. And when I said it to him, he had nothing to say. And he looked at me and he's like, like, you're right. You're right. That was it. Kevin and I are still very good friends to this day. He apologized to Julie. I, I don't know if he can ever unsay the things that he was saying, but he got it. And then to me, that's when it's so core. Now, if I, if you went, when I went to church and like I was four years old, my dad went into confession to say his confession. He came out and told me that he told the priest what he'd done wrong. And the priest said, say all these prayers and everything's gone away. Those are kind of aspirational values. When you get to say a couple of prayers and then everything's good, Core values mean you don't do it, Right. period. Now, if you hire and fire based on core values, you don't get away with breaking them. That's why I limit them to four or five core values that are short phrases, easy to understand, not single words, and not aligned to make up some fancy acronym, <laughs> right? It's not about the acronym. It's about the core right. values. So like uh, you say, not single words, we've been trained on that as well. So instead of saying like integrity, we say, we do what we say we'll do. Correct. Right. right? Deliver what you promise. Honesty right. will be, we're honest in every category. Bingo. Exactly. So okay. they're so clear. They don't need a bullet point underneath to explain them. And you limit them to four or five. If you've got 10 or 12, it's too many. Yeah. Like I, as somebody told me that the original Jewish faith, the ultra Orthodox have like something like 417 commandments. I mean, it's impossible. You just can't live with 400. You just sit in a room, right? Like with you, styrofoam around. Yeah. It's like even the Catholic church has 10 and I still think that's too many. Three of them are about don't kill people, right? You can, <laughs> so you can shorten it down to seven. And, right, right. So I think that's what I'm talking about. It's the core values. The third is the BHAG. The okay. BHAG is that big, hairy, audacious goal that Jim Collins talks about. Mm -hmm. It has to be a 20 or 30 year push that from the outside might seem impossible and from the inside you might think is possible. Mm -hmm. And the best example still to this day is 30 years ago, Microsoft had the big hairy audacious goal of putting a computer on every desk. Mm -hmm. They later abridged that to a computer a desk and every household. Think about this for a second. That's a pretty crazy goal. Now it doesn't seem like it, but no. back then it was well almost unbelievable. Back then it was very audacious. Here's even now why it's a little bit unbelievable. Microsoft doesn't make computers. So Microsoft's goal was to put a computer on every desktop. How are they going to do that? By creating this amazing software that we couldn't do without, that we would need, so we would require to have a computer. Right. That's a very big, hairy, audacious goal. That's a 20 or 30 year march. That's from the outside world seems impossible, but they saw their way towards that and it kept aligning them. That's really cool. And BHAG, that's Jim Collins, is that from good to great? From good to great, yeah. So my BHAG is to replace vision statements with vivid visions worldwide. <laughs> I like the way you phrase it. How do most people create their vision yeah. statement based on the way we've been taught to create that? Right. So most, we, we were, most of us were taught either in business school or in a book, get your employees together, get your leadership team together, go off site for a day, put a whiteboard up or get a flip chart. Everybody put their favorite words up on the whiteboard. Let's vote on our favorite words. When you're left with like six or seven words, mash them up into one sentence. Like take those six words, create a sentence around it. That's your mission statement. Go train, <laughs> Right. Well, the reality is everyone goes, it's really cheesy. It doesn't really explain enough. And it's just one sentence. Right. For me, the vivid vision is almost as if you went into a time machine 
three years from out, three years from today, so December 31st, three years from now, and you look around your company and you describe everything you see. Right. You don't describe how it happened, but you describe the company three years out. You describe your meetings, describe what your employees are saying about you, describe what your customers are saying about you. You describe the market, you describe what the media is writing about you. You talk about your dashboards and the way you're making decisions, your company culture. You describe operations, sales, marketing, IT, finance. You describe it all so it becomes a four or five page written document describing your company in its finished state three years from now. Right. Then you can create the plans to make it come true. Then you can attract employees who are excited. Then you can, because people are excited about the future. Today just looks kind of like it does. You know, we went through this exercise. That was actually the first exercise you gave us as my coach, right? I think we started with you from the date of this recording. It was like two months ago, okay. something like that, right? Maybe a month and a half ago. I remember you said, okay, you write it, not Rob, yep. not anybody, but but you just got to be your vision, yeah. the CEO, CEO, and then get with Rob to be able to help you ask qu more questions, make sure it's clear and all that. Yeah, and Rob's your second in command. Right, my second in command, right? So it was interesting because the part that helped me the most, you know, getting in the time machine, that was cool. Describing it seemed hard, but what was easy is describing it from other people's perspective. It's easier for me to define that, what my employees are saying about working here. That was easier for me to right. than, to, than to come up with on my own from my perspective of how the workplace is for the employees. What the media is saying about us is very easy then for me to say how we want to look to the come to the media. Correct. And it was great because coming up with stuff like that, like what do our partners think about us? What is, what is our audience or our podcast, like this this audience, right, of this podcast? What are they saying about us? And what, what does our competition say about us? All that stuff was so easy for me to create that I was just writing. There was no pausing. I was yep. type, 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 type. And then I got this whole thing and then you, you looked at it and you go, okay, that's great. Cut it down by two thirds. Well, you, like, oh. you, you did an amazing <laughs> job. I mean, you actually created seven pages, which is spectacular, but you, right. you, you could actually trim it down to a point that it becomes readable. We got it to four. Another great way to do it, by the way, for anyone who wants to write a vivid vision. And I cover this in three of my books, The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs, the book called Vivid Vision is the second one. And then the third is in my first book, Double Double. Mm. But I would read The Miracle Morning for Entrepreneurs actually, because I think it's probably a great lay for anyone listening. Another way to get started on your vivid vision is to record yourself and just walk around recording it on Siri or just even your audio and just allow yourself to think out loud because often it's hard to type it all down. We get kind of trapped. Right. But just walking around thinking about all the different areas and describing it and then record it or transcribe it and then you can kind of write it down later. You know, I use a really great app called Voxer. You ever use Voxer? Yeah. Yeah. And so Voxer has, you can message people, but you can also message yourself. There's a, there's one that's called My Notes. Okay. And so you can box yourself notes. And so it's like a walkie-talkie app. It's like instant messaging, but it's voice, right? And instant message. And you can do text too, but obviously we use it for voice. It's great because if people are driving, but they don't have to read. It's just a quick, quick button. You can just keep going. It's just very quick communication. And you can do group text, broadcast, all that. But the My Notes is great because whenever I do have a thought, I'll just Voxer My Notes. And then I can go back and I can listen to those later. So that's a good idea. I like that too. Okay. That's so actually how I wrote three of my books. Is Voxer. Yeah. No, or, or, or visually just recording. Different. I just walked around talking and then I had some people interviewing me and pulling more of the content out. And then we had enough to actually get writing on the first, the first oh, round. Oh, wow. That's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. So we've got, now we understand the difference between vision statement. We understand vivid vision. Yeah. We've got core values. We've got purpose. As far as the plan, the plan I'm assuming is now that's the part of filling in the gaps. Yeah. So if we were, again, building a house as an analogy, the homeowner knows what they want the house to look like. Mm -hmm. The contractor can create the blueprints or the plan to make the vision come true. Okay. The contractor signs off on the vision from the homeowner. The homeowner signs off on the blueprint saying, yes, we, we kind of agree. Okay. And then you hand the plan, the blueprints to the employees who make the house built. And that's what you asked me to do. So now and it was easier for them because now they, what you, what do you say? It's like they're reading my mind. Yeah. So right? now, now you've got your draft of your vivid vision done. We're going to get the design elements to it. We'll share it with the world so everybody can see what it looks like. Right. Then we're going to give that to the employees and your leadership team. And they'll look at it and try to figure out how do we make every sentence come true. And almost like building a home, it'll be like some parts are foundational. Some will count second, some will come third. Some parts of the vivid vision we'll do in the third year. Some parts will make happen in the second year, some parts will make happen this year in fourth quarter, third quarter, second quarter, right? So we decide which parts do we build off of that become foundational from everything else. And for me, that's where we have the vivid vision, the core values, the core purpose, the BHAG, the plan, the people systems. I start with all that stuff as core and foundational. Then we get into all the sales and marketing, right? Yeah. 
what's the point of, of driving a whole bunch of people to your location if you have shitty employees? Yeah. You're going to just turn them all away. Yeah. Right? You're not going to maximize revenue. You're not going to drive referrals. You're not going to have happy, engaged customers. Work's going to be hard. You're going to be you know, hurting cats or mm-hmm. holding people accountable. But if you have the right people, everything goes up in the right direction. Right, right. Yesterday, you don't know this. I was going to text you, but then I wanted to tell you in person because I knew I was going to see you the next day. Yesterday was my favorite coaching session that we've had so far. Um, well, I because I was exhausted coming off of five hours sleep and traveling. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, so I'll tell you why it was my favorite one. The, the challenge I share with you is I feel like I'm doing so many things. Mm. I've got this podcast. I've got the conference coming up. I've got our new program for our learning center, our university. We've gotten, or understaffed. I'm recruiting. We're looking for people. I'm training. We're doing so many things, right? And yep. And on top of that, I got regular stuff that I've got to do, conversations with certain customers and employees and leadership meetings and all that stuff. Uh, and you've got four kids, don't you? And I've got four kids right. under 12. Right. One of them's two. And I just got a new puppy. Right. And my wife. And you're married to someone you want to stay married to. You and my whole lot going on. And my wife's one of her love languages is quality time. Right. And acts of service. <laughs> and good luck with this. <laughs> now, you've got to do less stuff, not the stuff that you're doing, right? Right, right. So now you said to me, and it was, you know what's great? You know how like uh, sometimes serendipitous, and you could call it serendipity, but I, could, I, I think it's actually like a phenomenon where like you, you don't notice a car till you get it. Now it seems like everyone driving's got the car. Yeah. You, the video I saw right after our conversation where you told me, you said, Mike, you're doing too much. You've got to do less, but more important stuff. <laughs> the video right after was titled, Busy is the New Stupid. And it was Bill Gates talking about a conversation he had with Warren Buffett and how Warren Buffett has maybe three things in his calendar for the entire week. And those things are must-dos. Yep. Everything else, it's him reading, learning, and that's pretty much it. Yep. Mentoring his team. And Bill Gates said when he saw a Warren Buffett's calendar for the first time, because he goes, Mike, I thought I was on fire. I had everything end-to-end built up from 6 in the morning. He, he was doing it backwards. Bill Gates was doing this, right? So anybody listening going, oh, I'm not cut for this. Bill Gates was doing this after being a billionaire. And then he saw Warren Buffett's calendar and Warren Buffett changed his whole life. Two things you just said. One is around that lesson of getting to work on the critical few things, right, versus the important many and following that Warren Buffett rule. The second one is the richest person on the entire planet is still learning and is okay with being wrong, is okay with publicly saying that they're wrong, is okay saying they're publicly wrong not to kind of leverage and sell something. It's just like, wow, they're admitting they're learning and growing. Sometimes if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Right. And it's pretty inspiring to see Bill. I saw Bill last week at the TED conference. He goes to the main stage TED as well every year. But when you're that smart and you're there sitting in the audience learning, wanting to learn, that's a pretty big lesson. And so now I want to tie into that because the coaching session we had, I, I just want to coach these people with what you told me. I said I was busy. And you said, Mike, you've got four different types. I want you to map out all the things that you do, and I want you to put them into four different categories. Yeah. What are those categories? And I forgot to send this to you. I'll send you the worksheet called an activity inventory, and we can link it in the show notes if you want, so yeah. everybody can do it for themselves. Great. But here's essentially how it is. Pretend that somebody videos you for an entire month, and they walk around filming you, right? Mm-hmm. Pretend that McKenna, who's filming us right now, is filming you for an entire month, right? And then you watch the video of everything you do for a month, and you write down everything that you do, right? You can either write it down on this worksheet or you can write it down in a word, in a, an Excel document. Um, and, and one row per thing, like I open emails, I read emails, I reply to emails, I file my emails, I, I book meetings, I show up at meetings, whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Coach people. Then I want you to categorize everything in one of four ways. Either I for incompetent, C for competent, E for excellent, or U for unique ability. Incompetent means we suck at it. Competent means we're okay at it. Excellent means we're really, really good at it, but we don't love doing it. You for unique ability means we're really, really good at it. We love doing it. We actually get energized doing it. Like for you, podcasting is a unique ability. You're really good at it and you're, and you love doing it. And it's amazing to watch you in this zone and you are in your unique ability zone, like Larry King style unique ability. Why? That's, For real. Donnie seriously, Deutsch. like that's crazy. No, no, Donnie <laughs> Deutsch, Larry King. I'm actually have an introduction to Larry King happening today from wow. Harvey, Harvey McKay, but that's the zone you're playing in, right? There's other stuff that you're really good at, mm-hmm. but you don't get energy off of it. Right. Then the competent and incompetent we all get. Right. The difference though between excellent and unique ability is you would do this for free, except you have bills to pay once in a while. <laughs> Right? I would agree with that. That's the unique ability zone. Like we're good at it. We love it. We're amazing. We do it for free. The key is how do we get everything off our plate that we're only incompetent, competent, or excellent at? So we're left working on the critical few things that are in our unique ability zone. 
The next category, that I, the way that I track them is if I was going to pay someone to do this job, open emails, if I was paying them to do that every day, all day, what would their hourly rate be? And then let's get all the stuff off our plate that is less than our effective hourly rate. Like, like the what you're worth. Yeah. So my effective hourly rate right now is $1,000 an hour. My coaching is $2,200 an hour, but I've put a bar in place that anything I would pay someone less than $1,000 an hour to do, I'm not doing anymore. So there's a lot of stuff that I do that's not a $1,000 an hour job, but speaking is, coaching is doing media interviews is, but there's a lot of other busy work, even high impact work, that if I could pay somebody 500 bucks an hour or 100 bucks an hour or $50 an hour or 20 bucks an hour, I should get all that off my plate. And instead of working harder, I think most entrepreneurs is like a fly trying to get out the window. We're working harder, working harder, work harder, work harder, work longer, harder. You end up dead on the windowsill. But if you just realize there's a door right here that's open, if you're turning both the door, you're free. Most of us don't stop long enough to either get the coaching or the mentoring or to become self-aware or listen to other people and we're gonna keep working harder. Before we continue on that thought, because I wanna make sure everyone watching can do the math for themselves here. Sure. You've determined that your hourly rate would be $1,000 or higher, right. depending on what you're doing, but no, anything lower than 1,000 you're paying for, how do I determine my hourly rate? So I, took, all I took my net my net of 2 million last year as my net income. So I took that and divided it to come up with the effective hourly rate of $1,000 an hour. Okay, so what, so what you took home, not what your company did in revenue. Correct. So yeah. if you, if, let's say that you did, yeah, not revenue, profit. So if, right. you, if you take $100,000 out as an employee, that's an effective hourly rate of $50 an hour is 100,000 a year. But if you're $200,000 a year, then you're taking 100 an hour. If you're $50,000 a year, it's $25 an hour. So whatever you personally earned last year. Correct. Okay. And you should get everything off your plate that is less than that. Okay. Right. We already understand that with things like we don't clean our own homes. Most people have a cleaning lady who comes and clean for clean for us or cleaning person, I guess. And that's kind of like a fifteen dollar, twenty dollar an hour task. But why are we changing light bulbs and changing air filters and cutting our own grass and filling up our car with gas? I have a client who has three cars. Every Monday and Thursday, someone fills them up with gas and washes them, so all three cars are are cleaned, washed with <laughs> twice a week. He's like, that's only saving me fifteen minutes per car per week, but that adds up to fifteen minutes. I could be reading a book. Right. Calling a friend, focusing on throwing one of my employees. An employee. So what's the value off our critical few things versus the busy work that we end up getting stuck in? We talked about earlier, you know, I've gotten to work with now 1400 studios, but I, what I will say is a lot of those guys, they actually are worth more than what that math would tell them because right. they're starting their business. So they're a year or two in. So a lot of money has gone into the business and so they may even show as a negative hourly rate. It's what would their effective hourly rate be if they were being paid to do the job is another way to look at it. Okay. Right. If someone was paying you to run a business. If you were able to duplicate yourself and you were going to hire yourself, what would you pay that guy? That's one way to look at it, right? Okay. Or just say, what do you not want to work less than? Like, I don't want to do jobs that are worth less than this. First, you can, you can do it without the money. You can also just get everything off your plate that you're competent and incompetent at. Hey, you, know, you can hire you can hire remote assistants in the Philippines or India. I've got a person who does research for me in Karachi, Pakistan for three dollars an hour. Now, when you say research, like what kind of stuff? Online stuff, compiling lists, compiling mailing lists, proofreading documents for me. Proofreading in the Philippines, they'll proofread documents. Yeah, for they speak you. perfect English. So you can get people to find people on Upwork for me, so they can post projects on Upwork and find me the three people for each of the projects, and then I can pick. Now, Upwork, for those of you guys that we use Upwork and you use it more, and actually I'm going to be using it more after yesterday's coaching session, but Upwork is a is an awesome, awesome tool. It allows you to be able to not only hire people that are able to do certain things for you that you don't have to hire a full-time employee for, because you don't need a full-time employee for a lot of things, but you can actually even see like how many jobs they've done and what their average rating is, like Yelp yeah, or like Yelp for contract work, exactly. Right. And here's the thing about hiring contract. Most people say, oh, I've had terrible time like hiring contractors. It's probably because you did no work on actually hiring them. Put the same amount of time into figuring out which subcontractors to use as you would in hiring an employee, and you'll end up with really great subcontractors. Or get them, hire three to do three little, let's say I wanted to get some job postings rewritten by a copywriter to make them pop. So when I'm recruiting somebody, they look more like job ads, right? right? right. I could send out the same job posting to three different copywriters, pay each of them 50 bucks to do it, and then get them back and go, wow, this one's unbelievable. Now I'll give that person three to do and I'll see how they do. And then if they do great on three, then I'll give them all of them for the next five years. I've got a woman right now who creates all my worksheets for the CO Alliance events and for any of my corporate events. I don't know where she lives. I know her name is Tanya. I don't know her last name. I don't even know the hourly rate. I think she's like 25 bucks an hour. Okay. But I just send her the worksheets, sometimes hand-drawn, and they come back to me unbelievable like a day later. Wow. But if I had a full-time person in-house doing that, they're busy, it delays their projects. Yeah. The key is is not knowing how to do something, it's knowing who to do it. 
and realizing we don't need them all as full-time people. We can have a database of fractional yeah. people and you can have a fractional person overseas managing all your fractional people for you. Yeah. I was uh, in January, I went to a cruise with my wife and it was a work cruise. It was uh, Russell Brunson had this thing for his inner circle people. And I told him like, yeah, I really wanted to start outsourcing a little bit more. I know it's good. He goes, you got to meet this girl, Anissa. Anissa Holmes is basically me, but for the dental world, mm. right? It's, it's, she's brilliant. She lives in Jamaica and only has American clients. And she outsources to people that are not in Jamaica or US. And so right. the people doing the work are in neither country. Yep. She manages all. Her business is doing about four or five million. And what does she do? Not only marketing, but growing the operations. Like she is a dentist. She has a seven figure dentistry herself. And uh, I'll introduce you to her if you like. Yeah, she, I've got three she's clients awesome. in the dental space. Yeah, she, she and her product is just great. But what, what was really amazing, he said, you got to meet with her. So Russell told me to meet with her. I went to go met with her. And we were actually taking a boat from like one island to another. So I sat next to her for 45 minutes. Awesome. I was like, what do you do? She uses Asana. But what she does with Asana, which is, uh, by the way, it's a great project manage management tool. But whenever she outsources, she has templates for everything. And she has screen recordings of exactly how she wants it done. Mm -hmm. And so whenever a contractor, let's say, gets sick or leaves or whatever happens, the new one jumps into the same system. You can't mess it up. All you have to do is follow the bullet point list that goes along with the video of how to do it, and it's done. She even outsourced those videos to be done. Amazing. That's the new way of doing business versus the old way of hiring a full-time person. And I like the whole, the way that they're delegating to make sure they delegate with enough specific specificity. Specific uh, specifics so that it, what comes back to you is what you're looking for, yeah. right? Yeah. Usually if you don't get the work back the way you wanted, it's because you didn't delegate it correctly in the first yeah. place. But, yeah, a lot of people are bad delegators. Yeah, very. I, I used to be a really, really bad. And they get frustrated with their employees. The reality is employees can't read your mind, dude. You yeah. delegate it poorly. So how do you delegate correctly? It's to really think about the output that you want back and describe it in a way that they can see what you want. Also to explain the ROI as to how much time and money and resources you want to put in. Because often you'll delegate, but people will spend six days doing something that you only want to spend an hour on. That's really, really critical as well, is really telling them not how long you think something is going to take, but how much time and how much money you want them to spend on that so that they don't overdo it. It's kind of like if I said, clean my kitchen, you could spend all day cleaning. Easily. Kitchen, yeah. But I only meant just tidy it up in 15 minutes. Right. Right. It's very, very different from clean my kitchen, don't spend more than 15 minutes versus clean my kitchen, open-ended window. You have one of the best TED Talks out there with raising kids mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs. And you have another TED Talk I saw as well with Vivivision, I think. Yeah. I love TED Talks. And there was this one, I can't, and it's going to bug me. I can't remember who it was that said it, or who, who gave the speech, but there was a study that was done. And the study basically had two groups of high school kids. And it was like 100 kids and 100 kids. And each of them was given the exact same project. One of them was given a 30-day window to get the project done. The other one was given a 24-hour window to get the project done. Now, with this group, the 24-hour group, parents were calling, complaining, kids were making excuses, all that stuff. But you got to get it done. This group, at the end of the day, actually outperformed in grades the group that had 30 days. This group got, they, they would procrastinate. Because if, if you have 30 days, it'll take you 30 days to do it. Exactly. If you have 24, because here's what they found, is most of the people, I think it was like 80-some percent. They all do it in the last They all did it the last day anyway. Yeah. It was more of a stress thing, right? So I, I, and it's funny because I actually made a note about this this morning. I was doing a coaching session with a client in, in Thailand, a major company in Thailand that I coach, and I was coaching their second in command. And we were realizing that they kept saying that they were going to get something done in three days. They were going to do something in three days. And I said, you know that three days is 10% of your month. You understand that three days is 1% of the year. Right. So whenever you push something off by three days, you're, you're delaying it by 10% of this month. So Three days is one one hundredth of, of a year. So I actually want you to think about when somebody say, I'll get it done by Monday, that can often mean a 2% delay and those 2% delays compound. What's happening is they often don't understand the scope of the project, why we're doing the project, the urgency of the project relative to other things. And we don't delegate to them saying how much time we want them to spend. We often tell them how much, how much money. Like, go buy lunch for the company. Don't spend more than $200. We wouldn't say go buy lunch because they're going to come back with like, <laughs> right. right? So we often delegate specifically on the cash but we don't say how many people we want involved or how many hours we want spent. And I think we need to think about that more as a company. Now let's get down to the fitness studio owner level. I want- You know, you and I were even talking about that, about today we're gonna we're gonna get some of your t-shirts. You have t-shirts from every single client you've ever had, like 1,400 t-shirts <laughs> in the back, it's crazy. 
But I was saying, get some of your great t-shirts and frame them so they're up around your office walls. Mm -hmm. And I said, but don't overspend. Like, remember we even talked, I gave you some rough ideas. And keep it in bulk so it's faster. Yeah, right. So how do we actually do it the right way? Otherwise, you could be spending $150, $250 to frame each one. Right. But if we do it properly, we could probably do it for $40. Yeah, I love that. That's another thing, guys. This is something that I learned, and Cameron, you, you've held me accountable to it too, but never keep anything in my head. You even said yesterday, you go, how are you, are, how are you going to remember this? You were telling me to do right. something yesterday. You're like, how are you going to remember this? I'm like, Rob taking notes, and Rob got to take this notebook. But as soon as you told me to do the, the vision, or the, the, jer- the, the shirt framing thing, I immediately went to Rob, and I said, Rob, add this to our agenda for the meeting, because we're going to get this done. Right, but now you did something that's really smart. You didn't say start it. You said add it to the agenda because in the meeting we'll talk about it and we'll decide when to green light it right. and start it, when to yellow light it. I mean, we're going to do it, but not yet. And maybe we'll kill it and red light it. Right. Most entrepreneurs have an idea and they want it done. Really what the entrepreneurs want is the idea to be put in a place where once a quarter we can vote on which ideas to start because mm-hmm. people are already busy doing stuff. Yeah. You know what's interesting too about that? We, we don't just talk about things as they come up unless they're urgent. If there's something that anybody on the team has an idea for, they just add it to the Asana project that we will open up at the meeting for that particular thing, whether it's marketing or sales or operations, we have meetings for each thing. And what we've noticed is a lot of times you get to the meeting and that thing we were exciting. Yeah. The thing we were excited about, we go, you know what? Just never mind. I I thought about it a little bit more. And now, but, but if I didn't just take five seconds to add it to the meeting, I would have taken 30 minutes of not only my time, but someone else's time to game plan something that I would have bumped a week later. Bingo. Exactly. It's really cool. So now let's get down to the fitness studio level. The average fitness studio that we see right now, they're doing around three to $400,000 a year, probably around a 12% net profit. The best fitness studio owners that we're working with, they're doing close to, if not just about seven figures at their studio. It's very typical to do much more than seven figures in a fitness studio. So fitness studio is generally right around 1,500 to 2,500 square feet. Yeah. And you have classes and stuff right. like that, right? Limited people in the class. And then there's people that are, you know, they're five, 10 years in, they're still doing 150 okay. and they're barely making it. If they're making money, they're barely making money, yeah. right? Majority of people are right in that middle part though. The biggest issue with them is I see we're driving a lot of leads to them, but they don't have a lot of things in place in order to maximize that. Meaning yep. employees, they're doing a lot of the sales. They're doing a lot of the follow-up. They're doing a lot of the asking for referrals and case studies and getting them to upgrade and ascend into bigger models or ancillary sales. All the things that actually need to be done for them to go from just selling the burger to selling the fries and the shake and getting a lifelong sure. customer. How do I start? Let's say I'm that fitness studio owner. I come to you. You're my coach. I go, man, we're doing about three hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year almost four hundred thousand a year i feel like i'm doing everything at my company what do i hire first so well first thing i would do before i hire is i would actually craft a vivid vision for what your company looks like in three years so you're clear on what you're building got it so i'm not just putting pieces together yeah kind of start clearing and then work backwards from what it looks like in three years back today second thing i always try to get rid of the stuff that is on my plate that drains me and hire some people to do that or stop it Or if I hate sales, don't do the sales. Right. And either optimize it or automate it or outsource your sales or hire somebody to do your sales. But if you hate doing it, get someone else to do it. How do you see yourself outsourcing sales? You could have a fractional person. You could have a full-time commission person. You could have an agency that does sales and marketing for you that, you know, signs clients. Um, There's lots of people out there that would do stuff. The key is to understand what do you need done? Here's the thing. It needs to be done, but not by you. But sometimes they feel like it has to be done by them or it won't get done right. Because they haven't thought of another another way to actually right. get or to find someone else who could do it. So then if you understand what you want done for how much time and how much money, you can then find people to do that or hire people to do that or hire fractional people to do that. I love hiring what I call the mommy shift. So these are women who have kids in school that want to work between 930 and 230. It's five hours a day. Right. And they're so loyal and they'll crank hard and they're wicked smart, but they don't want a full-time job. They just want to work while their kids are in school. That idea. can be a really, really powerful, especially for sales and marketing. Mm-hmm. Um, to follow up with leads, get them booked, yeah. all that stuff. They can do it from home. They can do it on site. That's right. They don't need to be in the studio for that. They don't need to be in the studio and they don't really need to be there full time. And they're very, and they don't need to make a hundred grand a year. They're quite happy making 25 or 30 because it's a meaningful impact on their company or on yeah. their, on their home life. Wow. So yeah, because they get to work from home, have a regular schedule that works for their life. Yeah. They don't have to have daycare because their kids are in school. Yeah. But if it's an eight hour a day job, then they have to offset with daycare. It starts, it becomes a bit of an equalizer. Right. Right. So that's a really good way to look is to get that side taken up as the, the mommy shift. 
Then next, I always try to, to hire the revenue producing people first and the overhead, the, the back office people second. I don't mind spending on people that are going to drive sales and marketing so I can get more revenue, which pays the bills, right? There's not a single problem that exists that a check can't solve, mm -hmm. right? So if you have more revenue coming in with good gross margin, you'll actually be able to pay for the back office stuff later. What do, what do you say to somebody that says, I can't afford advertising? You can't afford not to do good advertising. Okay. I think you have to, nowadays more than ever, you can measure a lot of advertising. Just don't go throw like a print ad in some magazine or a billboard and you're right. going to waste, or waste your money. But there's some advertising that could be very valuable. Yeah. But you've got to find, and there's thankfully there's people like you and there's there's groups that know the fitness industry well enough to know what advertising is really working. And uh, with sales people, you can't, you can't have too many good ones. No. Well, I'll give you an example. I talk about people that are in the industry. So you have, I coach you and your COO. Your COO is a member of the COO Alliance. Mimi from Gym Launch is a member of the COO Alliance. Mm -hmm. And then Bedros from Fit Body Bootcamp, I coach him and his team. Okay, yeah. well, I coach three of the major names in the fitness studio yeah. space. That's not really a coincidence, right? Right. So if you're looking to grow, then the people that are looking to you should actually hire you and hire people like that to help them grow because they already have the, or just do what they're telling you to do, right? right? Just take those lessons and do it. A lot of people don't do what the smart people are telling them to do. Well, then you're going to be like the fly banging your head against the wall. It makes sense to spend money on advertising if other people can show you the data behind it actually works. Mm -hmm. And don't spend a million bucks, spend 10, spend 20, spend 30 and dial it up as you see it working. Uh, when you have your people, whether they're remote, outsourced, full-time, part-time, whatever, you told me it's, it's important to be able to measure what they're doing and being able to make sure that they're doing the right things at the right times and hitting their metrics, mm -hmm. right? Because at the end of the day, you said it doesn't matter when they work. You said schedule shouldn't even matter as long as they're hitting their numbers. Yeah, I think a lot of a lot of this whole nine to five thing is really broken. To to really care about when someone shows up and when they leave, we're measuring the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. What I want to measure is their output. Okay. Are they getting the results on the stuff they're supposed to be doing for the amount that I'm paying them? Mm -hmm. I don't care if they work from three in the morning until six in the morning. As long as they're doing what I need gets done and they're getting the results for the money I'm paying, who cares? Yeah, you shouldn't. But you, because we're programmed to think we should program to watch the clock of show up at nine, leave at five. Right. Neither of those drive revenue. Neither of those drive gross margin. Neither of those make customers or employees happy. Well, I have to hold them accountable. Well, hire accountable people. So this is something else that every fitness owner can learn from. If you have the right employees, you won't have to manage them. They'll manage themselves. It's like forcing someone to set goals. If they don't set goals already as a human, they're not going to set goals. Yeah. And we talk about how you coach Bedros and in Bedros's episode, which actually of the day that we're filming this right now, it released today. It's great. But by the time this comes out, it'll probably be a few weeks after. But he said the same thing. He called it uh, crop dusters versus fighter jets, which is like fighter jets are A players, crop dusters are B, C players, everybody below that. But you had a, an analogy where it was uh, resources. A players are racehorses, B players are workhorses, C players have to go to the glue factory. Okay, so let me hear your, I've heard Bedros's, we've all heard Bedros's, let me hear yours. Tell me about A, B, and C. Yeah, so the A players are the racehorses. Those are the people that show up, get the results, drive hard, can do it on their own, are self-driven, they learn on their own, they don't need a whole lot of oversight and management. Those are like the, the true A players. Most people say I have an A player team. Bullshit. If I scratch the surface, at best you have Bs. A players are never looking for a job. You often have to poach them, right? A players are already working somewhere. They're not unemployed. No A players ever unemployed. Yeah. Right? They're working. B players are the good, solid workhorses for the money that we're paying. They're getting results. They might need a little coaching and, and mentoring. They might need a little cheering on once in a while, but they're the good, solid work hard. They grind it out. They get, the, you know, for their hours of the day, they get the results. But they they ha they meet the core values in the attitude. They meet the right? core values. Yeah. These are solid Bs, right? These are the if I was playing baseball on a baseball team, these are the solid base hit, the roll base hit, base hit, singles and doubles, singles and doubles, singles and doubles. Nobody's ever going to know your name as like a home run hitter, but singles and doubles, singles and doubles. And sure enough, wow, that guy's got like a 400 batting average. Right, right. The C players are the ones that have to go to the glue factory. These are the ones who just aren't getting the results. They're toxic. They're cultural cancers. They're a pain in the ass. They're hard to work with. You could get rid of them and no one would even notice. It's almost like I talk about um, a hockey team where they'll have five people on the ice and, and then they have a penalty and they have to play shorthanded and they're playing four against five right. and they score a goal. They almost didn't need the fifth player, right. right? Right, right. That's often what a C player is as well. Now, let's say the person that's listening right now goes, yeah, I've got a C right now. I know I've got a C, but yeah. I can't afford to get rid of them. The data says the cost of the wrong person is 15 times their annual salary. So you have to get rid Why? of them. Why? Like, how does that come? Negativity problems they're causing, mistakes that they're making. A players are going to come to you and say, I quit because I can't work with Bob. And you're like, no, no, I'll fire Bob. They're like, sorry, I've already accepted an offer. 
customers that won't give you the rest of their business, all the time you spend even talking about them or thinking about them and managing them when you could be spending that time with an A player. Like imagine if all the negative time you spend with a C, you spent spending time with an A player. That A player would be like, wow, I'm finally loved. Yeah. We have to give our grain to the best horses. We often give our grain to the worst horses. Right? We have to give our care to the best horses. We often give our care to the worst horses. Right. I feel like you should know Mike McCallowitz because you guys are part yeah, of, of like EO. And yeah. Stuff. I just saw his book yesterday. Have you read it? Pumpkin no. Plan? No. This is really great. You talk, one that just came he's out. got Profit First. And he's oh, got another one that just came out. Yeah. I can't remember what it's called, but it just came out. Um, but yeah, the, the Pumpkin Plan is one of my favorite books, but it talks so much about that. So he talks about there's colossal pumpkins and regular pumpkins. And like the regular pumpkins you get around Thanksgiving, Halloween time, they're $5 at Walmart. Those... You just plant the seeds. They got to be, they got to come from seeds from regular pumpkins. You plant the seeds, you water them. If, they, if they're not sprouting, you just water them a little more and you push through and whatever. The colossal pumpkins are very different. These could be 2,000 pounds and then they cost $1,500 a seed. So an ounce of pumpkin seeds is worth much more than an ounce of gold, in other words, which is crazy. Because they use it for PR and marketing, right? Sure. See my yeah. ribbon wedding pumpkin or whatever. Now to grow a colossal pumpkin is different. You plant the seeds a little further apart. What you do is you wait for the first one to sprout. As soon as you see that one sprout, you rip out all the other seeds and you actually challenge this one. So you pound, you actually make the dirt tighter. So it has to work harder. You rip the other ones out so it doesn't take the nutrients away wow. from it because they're not colossal enough. Yep. Right. And so what happens is you give more of your attention and challenging moments to this seed in order for it to make it colossal. And then the other ones, like if you're going to nurture those, just know all you're going to grow at most is $5 pumpkins. See, I, I call these the grandmotherisms. Right. The stuff that grandmother would tell us that we know to be true. Just do that stuff. Right. If you went to a doctor and the doctor said, you have a culture, a cancer, a cancerous tumor in your body. How long would you take to get that cancerous tumor removed? Like right away. Right away. Yeah. Well, if you know you have a cancerous employee, a negative grumpy employee right away, like now. Well, I think the difference like, stop is- stop the podcast, walk out, fire them, come back in now. You're right. 100% right. I think the way people are looking at it is wrong because you figure if I get the cancer removed- I'm fine. Whereas they think if I remove the cancer, am I in a worse position? Because now who's going to do all that? So here's the way to test it. If the phone rang right now, mm -hmm. phone rang, you picked it up, you found out that person was just hit by a truck and killed. They were off going to some restaurant. They walked across the street. They're dead. Yeah. Grab a post-it note, write down the five things you'd have to do to replace them if they're dead, fire them and start working on item one. But we often come up with excuses for right. the reasons we haven't fired them. And most often, if you write down 10 reasons why you haven't fired that person, maybe they'll improve. Maybe I haven't coached them well enough. Maybe they're having trouble at home. Maybe they don't know what it, maybe I didn't onboard them well enough. All those mean you're chicken. When you have doubt, you have no doubt. I want to talk about the measuring. Right. So you got fitness instructors. Some of them take the roles as salespeople as well, because after the class, they'll take them through, they'll sell them, pitch them, do all that stuff. Not everyone's got a process. I talked about this in a video I just made. I went to San Diego. I was there to speak at a conference, but usually when I travel, I, I look to see if I have any customers in the area. I go visit them and hang out with them. And so I went there and they watch all my trainings in the morning. So they knew me. They, they were like, hey, Mike, how's it going? I said, okay, look, I want to see your process. Take me through. So they took me through and I, she kept messing up. She kept stuttering. And she said, I'm sorry, I'm nervous because you're here. You know what I told her, I was like, say the ABC. She says the ABCs, right? And I stopped her at J and I said, how old are you? She goes, 24. I go, okay, keep going. She was like, K, L, M, N, O, P. She went through. I go, you had no problem because you practiced that part. You have the ABC so down that you could be at Yankee Stadium in yep. front of 30 grand and do it, right? Totally. And you got to have your pitch down. I know that I say it and I feel like people listen, but I want to close out the other people that don't listen from a guy that works with such incredible entrepreneurs and companies like yourself what are your thoughts on your on the employees having a system and a process to be able to make sure that your vision is set and done? I, I agree to the point that I could say the alphabet backwards, right? Like Z Y W V or Z Y W X. Like like when you know the alphabet frontwards and backwards, then yeah. you can repeat it with confidence. Right. Um, I know the Greek Greek alphabet that way because I had to practice it enough to get into a fraternity. You have to script everything out mm -hmm. as if you're going to franchise your business. Michael Gerber from the E-Myth talked about creating the systems as if you're going to franchise. 20, 30 years ago, I was building a company called College Pro Painters. Yep. In fact, Kimball Musk worked for me at College Pro Painters. Elon's brother? Elon's brother. And I saw him at TED last week. And then uh, Peter Reeve, who was the CEO of Solar City, also worked for me in 1993. There was their cousin. We had a system for how to sell. It was called the 10-step estimate sell. 
But we scripted out each of the 10 steps. We trained each of our 800 franchisees every year on those 10 steps. So they all sold the same system with their own iteration and versions of it, but they at least followed the 10 plus one steps. Kimball to this day would be able to tell you the 10 steps, guaranteed. His cousin, Peter, who struggled, really probably wouldn't remember the 10 steps. I don't think he learned them well enough. I probably didn't coach him well enough. Mm. But yeah, you need to have the script for everything, the system for everything, and then let people follow the system a little bit. So we used to call, at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, we used to call it Bob proofing something. God, I hope he doesn't listen to the podcast. But Bob was a great guy from Buffalo, Bob Hartle. And he ran a a really small business in probably the worst market we had for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. It was Buffalo right? Tough market, bluer collar market. And they got like so much snow in the middle of winter is getting like 15 feet of snow, right? Like a bad day in Phoenix is like sunny. A bad day there is like six feet. So we used to create systems. We call it Bob proofing that Bob Hartle with one of Bob's employees in Buffalo in February had to be executing the system perfectly. That way we knew that the best franchisees could also do it, (laughs) right? So That's you, pretty funny. You kind of have to dumb it down so that it's simple. So your least competent employee has to be able to do it perfectly. Right. On every single day. That's one of the reasons why I love the systems from EOS Traction. Do you know what Wickman wrote about Traction? Yes. I think his systems are nice. They're good. They're simple. You know, Vern Harnish and Scaling Up and the Rockefeller Habits wrote amazing systems, but they're more complicated. Yeah. You almost need an MBA to focus on Scaling Up where you can really, they've dumbed down. So we've actually used Scaling Up. So, and it, it, it is difficult. So are you thinking if I switch over to Traction, am I Wait, able to, yeah? Okay. You can, you could implement Traction tomorrow morning. Half of my oh, coaching wow. clients use Traction, half use Scaling Up, and then we just kind of iterate. But yeah, Traction is very, very simple to execute. Okay. They kept it very simple. And I think you need to do the same with your sales scripts, the same with your operation scripts, same with your marketing. Okay. Right. So, like Tesla, when they built the Tesla, they kept the operating system simple. We talked yesterday to knowing them forwards and backwards. And so doing sales training about 15 minutes a day, just quick like role plays and just make sure you've done it. Yeah. And, do, and again, do sales training for no more than 15 minutes a day. Yeah. Right. Quick. Yeah. Well, you think that if you're doing an hour of sales training, that's 12% of their day, right? One eight, crazy 12%. when you think, you know, between that, when you said like three days is one hundredth of a year and, and like a, a third, what is it? A third of a month. Like, yeah. You've got to start, I I don't look at it that way yet, but now I I feel like that's such a great angle. And I had to look at it that way because when we were building College Pro Painters, we would have 800 franchisees that we would hire. They would hire 8,000 painters. And then between May 1st and August 31st, so in four months, the 8,800 people would produce $64 million in house painting. August 31st, everyone would quit and go back to school. So we would have to start the company again and hire another 8,800 people. Right. So when you only have four months to run your company, Four months to do 100% of the revenue. One week is 6% of your year. So we operated under a lot of urgency, under a lot of focus, under only focusing on the critical few. So I think those habits, those kind of OCD, reverse engineering, brief plan, execute debrief plan, kind of have have really become a part of me. Wow, that's awesome. So when I'm measuring my employees, here's the thing. If if they haven't been doing it yet, they're going to get pushed back from some people. They're inevitably will. Usually it's going to be the people that don't want the spotlight on them in the first place. That's going to be a fear of somebody that goes, okay, so now I'm supposed to do these scorecards, we'll start measuring, we'll start doing this stuff. How do you, A, present that to your team, wanting full engagement, and B, make a decision on what to do for the people that refuse sure. to do it? So what we're going to do is part of your vivid vision is going to be describing that that's the way we run our business and those are the kind of employees we have so that going forward, we only attract those employees who are excited about that. We also get our current employees to buy into that or leave. That is going to be the way it's going to be. You either have to be excited about this or there's probably other great companies out there for you to work for. But you got to get them to buy in. Then our job is to help them come up with the key metrics that they're going to be measured by to hit the goals and the business areas that they're responsible for running. So get them to come up with the metrics that they're going to be measured by. We sign off on those to make sure they're not sandbagging it. And then we actually help them with that. Would you ever challenge it? Like Totally, so raise the, the bar. bar. Yeah. So, yeah. How, would you, how would you challenge it? Let's say I brought to you my scorecard, I said, these are the metrics I think I should be held accountable to. I'd, I'd either say things like, you're sandbagging it. That's not enough. You can do more. Let's try this. What do you think about that? Could we stretch? We'll, we'll break the numbers down and look at that for a little bit, right? I will find ways to either kick them in the ass or hold a mirror so they can look into it or challenge them more or raise their bar or raise their confidence. They might be giving you a low goal because they don't have the confidence. Mm-hmm. They might be giving you a low goal because they don't have the skills. They might be giving you a low goal because they're afraid. They might be giving you a low goal because... They don't know another way to come up with a goal. So don't assume that it's because they're slacking off, but our job is to raise the goals to a level that are a stretch, but not too big of a stretch. And so they're measurable. Like every goal has to be either have a dollar sign, a number sign, or a percentage sign in it, so it's measurable. 
they have to be attainable. So if I think of SMART, shared, measurable, attainable, relative, and time-based, I, I have a different acronym for most mm -hmm. people. The attainable part means they have to be a stretch, but they can still get to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. for me to go out and say, I'm going to run a, a four-hour marathon, it's just going to ha not happen. But I met a guy the other day at TED. We were at the TED conference last week, and I met a guy who was training for the U.S. marathon team for the Olympics. His goal is to, to break two hours and 18 minutes in the marathon. That's really fast. That's really effing fast. Most people talk about breaking four hours. He's trying to break two hours and 18 minutes, right? He at least runs, though. Oh, yeah, so, no. Okay. He's, he's I, training for the marathon. He's not a guy Olympics. that's like, I'm going to do this. Okay. No, no. He's an Olympic-level, world-class okay. marathoner, right? So his goal of two hours and 18 minutes is attainable. For me, it's not attainable. I don't even know if I can drive that quick, a car. Right? <laughs> so for, for me, that wouldn't be a smart goal because it would miss on the attainable. Right, 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 right. So with your employees, it's helping them come up with a goal and come up with a plan with a goal and making sure they know that as soon as we sign off on the goal, I will or our team will help you get there. Yeah. So what do you need from us to help you? To help you either with your confidence or your skills, removing obstacles so that you'll get to that goal. And then we'll put a plan in place to make that goal happen. You know, a few years ago, I implemented scorecards for the first time. I had them for salespeople. They're, they're easy to have scorecards for. Everybody else was just a little more difficult. Mm -hmm. I remember... I did get pushback, but I didn't present it the way you said. I didn't have a vivid, vivid vision. I didn't show how this all fits into the puzzle. I just scorecards. We got a lot of pushback. People thought we were being watched and all that stuff. And I could see their angle. But the funny thing is, not even six months to a year later, everybody was into the scorecards. People are stopping to look at it. They're they're looking at how they rank and right. what's going it's on. Time the habit. And now, if I took it away, they would be uncomfortable. Yeah, they wouldn't know how to operate without. And it. new employees that jump in, it's not even. It's just part of the business here. Right. They don't even question it. So now you got to take that across the rest of the organization. Here's a great way, by the way, to tie scorecards into salespeople. Ask the salesperson how much money they want to make this year, because most salespeople are on commission. Right. Some of them. Yeah, ours are. Ask them how much money they want. How much money do you want to make? And if you want to make that much money, do you know how many leads you need or how many clients you need to land? Do you know how many you need to land this year? this month, this week, by day. Let me help you figure out a plan to show you if you execute this plan, you would generate that much money. So this, in fact, is not based on what you need for the company. The score is based on what they need. Correct. And so I would say to them, well, let's say you only want to make 70 grand. What if you made 100? How would that feel? Oh, I'd love to make 100. Tell you what, how about we set a plan? We look at what it's like to do 100 grand in profit for you. How about we create a plan for you to do 100,000? And then I will coach you and mentor you and sales train you to get you there. Would that, would you be in to be like, I'd totally be in. I'm not holding you accountable. I'm going to support you and help you get to 100. I've now raised your goal, which has raised your plan, which has raised the results you need, which you has activity. raised your activity level. Wow. So now you'll be like, of course, I'll do 30 phone calls a day because I know that'll get me to 100. In fact, if I do 35, I might get to 110. <laughs> right, right. I've raised your bar. Now the, the activity makes sense for them. Correct. And now they understand if I'm now measuring activity, it's not to hold them accountable, it's to help them hit their goal. And if we can shift as a company or as owners to say, I'm going to help you hit your goal versus manage you. And of course, whatever that is has to be, make sense for the company. It has, well. to, be, or it has to be, or you're going to have to raise it or change it. Right, 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 right. Yeah. That's really awesome. Yeah. This podcast could be 24 hours, but it's not going to be. Right. I've already had you twice and I did, I worked so hard to not ask any questions that I asked in the goat show, Cool. which I, we have it. You have, we know, if you notice, we haven't overlapped. No, it's been good. We haven't overlapped, but I do want one overlap. Sure. I want to talk about the, uh, the 11 habits, the 11 traits. Well, I, I'll let you tee it up because you know how to do it. Yeah. Do you want me to read them off my phone or Wh whatever is easiest for you and explain while you're pulling it up, what exactly are you pulling up? So these are, these are the 11 traits that describe entrepreneurial people or entrepreneurs. Um, and I want you to, I'll read out the 11. I want you to, if you're listening or watching, I want you to, to keep track on your fingers how many of these 11 sound like you. So are you often filled with energy? Does your mind get flooded with ideas? Are you driven? Are you restless? Are you unable to keep still? Are you often working on little sleep? Do you get euphoric? Do you get easily irritated by minor obstacles? Do you burn out periodically? Do you act out sexually, which is like flirting? And do you feel persecuted by those who do not accept your vision? If you said yes to at least five of those traits, not only are you entrepreneurial, but according to the medical community, you're on the spectrum for bipolar disorder. Five. So those, yeah, those are actually the 11 clinical diagnosed traits for bipolar disorder or manic depression. If you say yes to five, you're on the spectrum. If you, you say yes to nine, 10, or 11 of those 11 traits, you would probably be medicated in some way for mania or depression. And, and I've done that list of traits to audiences of entrepreneurs and had 95% of the audience say yes. I've done that same list to a group of accountants and had 5% of the audience say yes. Wow. 
you know, entrepreneurs are wired differently than the rest of the world population. We're most often, often entrepreneurs are on the spectrum for attention deficit disorder, on the spectrum for bipolar disorder, and often on the spectrum for narcissism and for Tourette's. Wow. So if you said yes to double that, 10, which is what I did. Yeah, I'm at 10 or 11. Yeah, go ahead and hit the like button and show some love because that's where I, I'm interested. I'm going to use that as a metric. Other metric, that's good. Yeah. Um, and I can link to that actually as well. If you want, we can even link to a, an interview that Tim Ferriss did with me uh, 10 or 11 years ago when he was he was staying at my house in Vancouver and he uh, interviewed me and, and we did talked about the highs and lows of CEOs. And so he did a, a blog post on entrepreneurial roller coaster. Wow. We that's amazing. To that too. Yeah, that was when he was just getting going too, about yeah, 10, 11 years yeah. ago, right? Yeah, I took Tim to his first Burning Man. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, that next summer. Yeah, that's good. And you've been to Burning Man now, what, like seven times, six times? Six times, yeah. If you guys haven't heard of Burning Man, Google Burning. <laughs> Cameron's got one of the most interesting lives I've ever like come across. Your books are incredible. And, and it's funny, I heard about your books before I heard about you. And the the first book I heard about was actually from a friend of mine, Matt Blanton. I don't know if you know Matt. No. He's, he's part of EO, but he's he's like, you got to get Double Double. You gotta get, so I got Double Double. And then I heard of Meeting Suck. So I heard of actually a couple books before I heard about you. Get his books. His stuff's amazing. The new book, Free PR, is fantastic. In fact, we even talked about possibly doing some stuff in our learning center for that, which is going to be great because you're... And if you like the stuff on PR, you want to learn about what he does. I mean, the GOAT Show, we talked about 20 minutes, 30 minutes on all the tactics or a lot of tactics that you've yeah. got. So that'd be great. Um, Cameron, you got the podcast, CEO Alli- uh, uh, Second in Command. You got CEO Alliance, which is an awesome organization that my actually my guy is going to tonight. Yeah, to the first dinner. one tonight. I, I just want my why, my core purpose is helping entrepreneurs make their dreams happen. And I, I'm frustrated watching us work hard when I think the cheat sheets are already there. So I would say take the systems that people have told you to use and use them. They're going to work. I think investing in your own growth, investing in your team's growth is huge. But I think the big lesson I would leave is that none of this actually matters. Like we're all going to die. This is just what we do to make money. Let's have some effing fun. Yeah. Right. Like let's have fun and laugh and play and hold hands when we cross the street. You know, do you know this year for Valentine's Day, I dressed up in a onesie that was like cup, like hearts onesie and went out to a high end restaurant in Scottsdale wearing a onesie. Yeah. I don't doubt it. Just to laugh. Right. <laughs> No, I, think, I think at the end of the day, let's have some fun when we do this too. That's awesome, man. And, and I agree. And sometimes, you know, I have to go back to that. My wife and I have conversations around like we hit triple of our goals that we set a couple of years ago. We need to chill. Yeah. We need to have some fun. And so I agree with that. And I couldn't agree more. Cameron, thank you again. Thank you. You're awesome. So keep going. There's another video for you right here filled with insights. So click and keep growing.